Okay. Does it look good? Sure does. Sorry. Yes? Sure does. Okay, beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. All right, sorry, get my life in order here. Okay, so we are here today to discuss codifying potentially the healing to wellness court. This um, has been a uh, long work in progress um, for me examining this. It's sort of, you know, admittedly out on the periphery of the healing to wellness court, um, you know, front of mind considerations. And so I'm excited to be able to dive in a little bit on some of the things that the wellness court might consider as beneficial in looking at the prospect of potentially uh, writing into code the existence and or operations of the healing to wellness court. Um, this is uh, you know, as I mentioned, a long work in progress, but if this is the first time that I've really talked about it in a large group like this before. So let's see how it goes. All right, here we go. It's happening. Okay, code considerations. There are so many. A tribal code, the written law, is just one manifestation of the overall mountain of tribal law that exists, both written and unwritten. The role of the tribal code varies significantly from tribe to tribe, and that really is the primary consideration, the primary driver for whether a, a tribe may want to codify their wellness court, and if they do want to, how they're going to go about it. There are going to be numerous instances where codification as a general concept is a no-go because the code just doesn't really work that way. There are all, also other instances, no tribes here, but some tribes for whom the tribal code has sort of just been left uh, neglected in a corner. It, it exists, but no one really uses it or references it. The last time it was updated was in the 1970s. Uh, it's just not very functional. And so in some ways it's like, well, why even bother now? In other ways, this might be an opportunity to revive that tribal code, to have it you know, updated so that it now reflects current operations. And we'll dive into a little bit why that may or may not be worth our while. So in my first little quadrant of considerations is the actual structure of the wellness court. We use this term healing to wellness court, drug court, problem solving court, and it has lots of names. It's also true it has lots of different iterations, lots of different structures. For some, the wellness court truly is a component of the judiciary. It is a docket of the wellness court and functions in ways just like other dockets. For others, that's not really true. We might have like a probate docket and we might have a children's court docket and we call the healing to wellness court a court, but it doesn't really function like those other dockets. It's more like a diversion program, uh, something that like a like class that people can take that we divert over there. Or we might think about it as a condition of probation. It's again, sort of like a, like a class or a program, but it's handled more by the probation department. Either way, not really what we would consider a docket of the court, even though we use that language. So, all of those, like we still might want to codify, but we might not put those in the judicial title of the code. They might go somewhere else. How does the tribe structure its government generally? Is there a judiciary title of the code? Are there other titles that we should be cognizant of? Is it just a general like law and order code? Rand we put it in alphabetical order because why not? Um, how is, the, how is the code structured? Does everyone have a copy on their desk? Um, is it online updated frequently? Is it just a stack of ordinances as the legislature adopts them in real time? All of these things are, are you know, real things that are happening and that's okay. I think that we can be intentional about how we wanna interact with the code as it is today, as well as how we would ideally as a collective, as a sovereign, like to see our code look in the future. 
separation of powers. I put this in just to note, how is the code developed? Um, when we think about the authority of the court, um, does the court have the authority to develop its own dockets? Do we need um, the blessing from the legislature to create a docket? Do we want the legislature or the executive branch involved in how the court structures itself? Um, I think, again, this really varies from tribe to tribe. There's no one model here. Some courts are, are really restricted in how they can manifest beyond just the typical trial level court. Other courts have really broad authority that once the judiciary was established by the executive and legislative branches, they're on their own. They can create appellate courts, they can create these separate dockets, they can create these restorative justice courts like a healing to wellness court. They're kind of on their own and don't really need to go back to the code to reiterate that. A lot of the judiciary operations are reflected more in rules of the court and policies and procedures. So rather than codifying the wellness court, it make, makes more sense to include the wellness court amongst all of the other documentation reflecting the rest of the judiciary. Uh, what are some of the benefits for codifying a healing to wellness court? The big one, at least when I was working with a lot of different healing to wellness courts is stability. Um, the Healing to Wellness Court, one of the many beautiful things about it is its frequent organic um, nature in becoming established. It's a, it's a group of individuals who are extremely passionate about this work, who recognize the benefits of restorative justice, both to like community values and traditional values of law, but also to the needs of community members who have significant substance use issues and for whom the carceral adversarial uh, typical structure of a Western court is just not responsive to their needs. Um, and yet that organic nature is often tied directly to those individuals, to their specific passion, so that when we have the slightest turnover, the wellness court goes away. Um, the wellness court goes away when the funding ends. The wellness court goes away when the advocates in tribal leadership turnover. And so the wellness court is only ever as strong as that initial core group of grassroots originators. Codifying the wellness court, at least in one place, like the tribal code, documents in wet cement that the wellness court is established and that in order to get rid of it, it's gonna require a disestablishment or another act of uh, another ordinance or resolution to take it out of the code that requirement, that involvement of the legislature and the inverse, the requirement of, that the legislature will have to act again in order to take it out, offer some stability. You're gonna have to fight to get rid of us now because we have established this wellness court and declare the wellness court as a value, a tenant, a core component of this tribal judiciary. You're gonna have to work hard to get rid of it. Authority, including limits on the authority. For most courts um, that, you know, the court as it is today in the 21st century is really rooted in this Western adversar adversarial structure. When we talk about governmental authority, we frequently are referencing that in relation to the individual and the infringement that the governmental powers might have on that individual's rights. So we talk about the authority of the government and the necessary restrictions on that authority in order to preserve individual rights. In many ways, that framework is just less relevant for tribes and the way that we conceive of our relations to each other and our relations to tribal sovereignty. Nevertheless, our courts are still really structured in that way. And so we think about the jurisdiction of the trial court, what authority does the trial court have over individuals and over the subject matters that they would like to resolve, the disputes they want to resolve in this judiciary? 
So when we inject a healing to wellness court, that is a rejection of that adversarial model, but still a court. We have to think about what kind of authority we want that wellness court to be empowered with. On the ground, the practical matter outside of these like philosophical considerations, who gets to be in the wellness court? Does the wellness court have the authority to uh, sanction someone to jail? Does the wellness court have the authority in and of its own accord to decide whether or not someone can be terminated from the wellness court? There are like real benefits, real incentives and sanctions that the wellness court can wield. And so we have to think about, do, do, should the wellness court have those powers? And if yes, do we need to empower the wellness court to, to exercise those powers? My favorite reason for considering codifying the wellness court into a tribal code is it uh, is this declaration that restorative justice, that traditional justice is now a core component of the tribal government. I think the code, even though it really is this manifestation of, um, of you know, Western law, we're, we're writing this code much like state municipal codes are so that the Western world can have some point of orientation to recognize tribal governments. It's also an expression of sovereignty. And just because tribes have been pressured to Westernize for a hundred years, doesn't mean we always have to. Rather, tribes, including via healing to wellness courts, have proven themselves to be leaders for the entire um, court system, including federal, state, and municipalities on how to do it right, how to use restorative justice principles that not just better serve the individual, but better serve the community. We should celebrate those innovative re-emergence of traditional values and make them permanent forums within our own tribal code. By solidifying it within the tribal code, we provide assurance not just to the litigants within our court and not just within our community members, which is reason enough, but it also ripples out to the rest of the legal community, that these are the tribal values that you need to take into consideration when you're interacting with us, whether it's via litigation or ideally when it's we're collaborating um, it through you know, joint jurisdiction courts or memorandums of understanding for transferring litigants between our courts or using uh, co-supervision uh, agreements as we'll talk about later this afternoon. Solidifying restorative justice in the code is just kind of cool, it's cool. There are disadvantages to codification, reasons why we should not quite dive in without uh, you know, being intentional about what we're doing. Um, is this codification, even though I'm excited about it, is it nevertheless not reflective of tribal norms, of the way that we either approach codification or what I think is happening for a lot of tribes is that the tribal code really is just one uh, iteration, one Western version of tribal law. But meanwhile, there's this whole other component of tribal law that's happening simultaneously that's distinct from the written tribal law. And here's where we incorporate our traditional values, our restorative justice values, our, um, our rejection of the Western adversarial model, and it doesn't need to be codified. In fact, codification would sort of undermine the work that we're doing. That's a pretty good reason not to codify. The benefits to civility, the fact that codification is hard and that modifying it is hard can also be a disadvantage. One of the like main components of a healing to wellness court is its plasticity, its flexibility, its ability to go with the flow. Right now we need these team members. Oh, we have a new participant with new needs. We need to bring in a new group, someone that needs to come into staffing. Oh, we have this participant who has other family members in need. 
we're going to bring them in, even though we haven't codified, you know, the ability to bring other family members in. We're able to, to shift and move with the participants' needs, and that flexibility is what makes our ability to respond so effective. Well, if we start codifying every single moment of the healing to wellness court, every single little bit of authority, we're suddenly cementing ourselves in and taking away the thing that made us great, the ability for us to shift and move with the needs. Once you codify one thing, it could imply that we lack all the other powers that we didn't codify, but that we had previously had be implied. It was assumed that we had those powers. But the second we codified one, we took that assumption away. That can be a detriment to codification and a real detriment to the healing and wellness court. Finally, I think it would be um, naive to think that codification, at least within the framework that most uh, written laws take, including tribal laws, they are still heavily influenced by the adversarial model. This whole nature of separation of powers, of this assumption of limited power, that this, this it's really heavily based in individual rights and an adversarial you know, prosecutor versus defense counselor framework. And despite our best efforts, codification may nevertheless still trip into that and absorb some of the adversarial flavors that we've been trying to shed by going this restorative justice route. Codification could be this, this dark temptation that robs us of some of the, the more healing and holistic components that we're trying to uh, engender in our healing to wellness court. I think that one is that um, potential disadvantage is not quite as real and scary as it seems. I think that the prospect of codifying the wellness court and uh, using codification uh, as a tool to combat some of that adversarial uh, seepiness is really strong. I think that that we should take the invitation to really weave into the tribal code restorative justice as a declaration, this is the new default. We like, yes, there's still this adversarial court, but we are no longer making that the default. We're pushing that aside and this is what we're doing now. That's my dream. And I think, I think the potential is real, but I, I do want to acknowledge it is an uphill battle presently. Uh, and so I'm really looking forward to seeing what tribes can do to sort of flip the narrative here. You know, I dived right in. I believe that we have the, um, the chat function and the question and answer function. So as I go along, I invite you to, to chime in with comments or questions as we go, and I'll lean on TLPI to help me navigate those. Um, so I, you know, the nature of this virtual like I can't see you and I so I'm, I'm assuming you're like bobbing your head or like washing dishes while you're listening which is totally cool but if, as thoughts pop into your head I invite you to, to join in. Okay so now I'm going to investigate a little of the um, actual nuts and bolts that if you if you have decided yes we want to at least codify something about the healing the wellness court so that it exists within the code what exactly should we codify? So in preparation for this presentation, I did a rudimentary scan of the tribal laws that are out there. Um, you're all tribal court practitioners, and so you know where your tribal laws exist. Um, ideally, they are on your tribal website. Uh, sometimes they're in a binder in the court clerk's office, um, and everything in between. Some of you are on Westlaw, like six of you are on Westlaw. Uh, some of you have your own like very fancy codes that are all um, like key sided and talk to each other and they're amazing. And the truth is that, you know, as diverse as tribes are, is as diverse as the tribal codes are, as including the ability to access those codes. So of the codes that I was able to find online, I uh, did a survey of like what's out there. And I found about 30 different tribes that have um, codified a healing to wellness court or you know restorative justice type thing 
into their um, codes and sort of did a compare and contrast with what's out there. Because the variety of considerations is so vast and the different types of structures of a tribe, you know, even before you get into the healing to wellness court are so different, it's not useful to either look at a model code or to even like do like a ranking of different tribal codes. They all are responding to totally different needs and there's very different reasons for why you would wanna codify certain provisions over others. So what this really is, is just sort of like, here's sort of all the different ways tribes have codified this. So you can pick and choose what might be useful to you, your healing to wellness court and your tribe's needs. So that's my, that's my goal here. Okay, entry and discharge. So the way I conceive of a healing to wellness court and how I've seen a lot of tribes conceive of their healing to wellness court is you have the, the adversarial court and then you have the healing to wellness court over here. And so what's relevant as far as the code is concerned is how a participant moves between those two legal entities. How does a participant go from the adversarial court into the healing to wellness court and how do they leave? And that's where we see the bulk of the codification work going. But before we even get there, establishing the court. My all time favorite code provision for a healing to wellness court is there hereby is a healing wellness court, period. That's it, that's all that said. They have merely used the tribal court to say, we now exist, but all of the other little details about what that means is left for other places, other times. As far as the code is concerned, all that is relevant is there, there is a healing to wellness court. This is a thing the, the, the tribe acknowledges like Godspeed. Other cool things that I've seen that I think, you know, like if, if you had to look at just one and only slide of this presentation, I think it's this one because I think that this, there is like, it's the biggest bang for your buck if you're going to be bothering with codification. One is the name of the wellness court. Pretty much every um, tribe that I saw that had codified the wellness court had bothered to provide a tribally specific name. Sometimes it was in the indigenous language. Sometimes it wasn't. Rarely was it drug court. Um, more often it was something much more related to healing, restoration, um, uh, some beautiful tribal name, just a, like incredible beauty was, was provided here. I think using the Healing to Wellness Court as an opportunity to quote, like re-indigenize the tribal code to really lean on um, indigenous languages, uh, it's just cool, it's just super neat. Is it like foundationally, you know, rooted in some legal concept necessary for the existence of a wellness court? I don't know, maybe, like maybe it is. We're talking about the reemergence of traditional values, the uh, a truly more responsive system toward the needs of our community members. I think there's an argument to be made that tribal language is a necessary um, ingredient in that, but I think it's also just cool. The authority of the court. We mentioned earlier, um, some tribal codes uh, have this built in where the court only has the authority bestowed to it via the tribal code. In those instances, I think codification is necessary. It's those tribes that I'm looking at that I think you really do need to look at your code to see is the wellness court operating in compliance with its code. It's one thing to be operating, you know, in silence and just like, well, we're kind of doing our own thing and it's fine. Like stability would be nice, but at least we're not operating in violation of the code. For those of you that require a codified acknowledgement, you are acting in defiance of your code. And that can be remedied through a codified provision saying, they're hereby as a healing to wellness court and they have the authority to exercise jurisdictions 
over persons that are referred by the court or whatever authorization is necessary. I think that is really important to look at. Similarly, jurisdiction. If the court is structured in a way that it limits jurisdiction over the persons that it can um, issue orders over, we're going to need to look at that. Um, if the wellness court was originally established only to serve adults for whom a criminal charge had been filed, but then the wellness court moved and started uh, exercising jurisdiction over parents for whom there was a dependency case issued or um, for, you know, started going pre-charge so that there were no charges filed or it, or it had to be deferred sentencing. We need to make sure that our jurisdictional alignment is in line. I think this is most relevant, again, for codes that build their courts with this type of structure in mind. That might not necessarily be your code, but if it is, we need to look at this. The, the flip is a concern too. If you start getting really excited about establishing this authority and this jurisdiction in a way that's really out of line with the way the rest of the code is structured, you could be hamstringing your wellness court unnecessarily. I think there's something to be said for providing yourselves stability assurance, um, you know, uh, comporting with the rest of the code, but without like unnecessarily restricting yourself. It's such a careful balance, which is why, you know, the actual building of a tribal code is a communal process. This has to be done in, you know, negotiation with all of our relevant tribal agencies, with our tribal leaders, with our community, because it's got to be relevant to all of these different people. And so, you know, me writing in like the corner of my house and being like, here you go, here's your beautiful code. It's, that's just not gonna work. The purpose of the Healing to Wellness Court. This arguably has less immediate direct legal significance, but I think it's a real opportunity, especially because likely, um, at least for most of us, the Healing to Wellness Court is the first truly non-adversarial component of our judiciary. It's the first declaration of this embrace of restorative justice, unlike other dockets of the court, like an appellate court or like a probate court. We're really saying like we're deviating from the norm here. We're building a whole new set of policies and procedures of uh, uh, rights that litigants have within the Healing to Wellness Court. And here's why we're doing it. I think that's important from a due process perspective. If someone feels like they've been treated unfairly um, within the Healing to Wellness Court, I think it has huge dividends for our uh, non-tribal partners, for states, for municipalities, for programs to get the, you know, FYI, here's what we're doing here and you should be on alert for both good and bad, right? But mostly good, like, like we want you to, to be in on what we're doing. And so here is a quick notice about what we're doing formalized within our tribal code. Um, there's lots of really cool stuff here. But like I said, as far as like legal significance of like authorizing the healing and wellness court, you don't really need a purpose. This is just a convenient place to put it because the tribal code is intended to be accessible for everyone. And so sort of like a federal register in that regard. Um, here is just some sample language of this whole establish and jurisdiction um, type framing. Like I said, I think the establish is, <laughs> it's so tidy. It's such a clean way to just say, there now is a healing to wellness court. There, done. Like if you were concerned about our authority or our right to exist, rest easy. We exist now. Jurisdiction. Um, this, especially because this is like heavy legalese, right? But it's actually not that scary. The wellness court may exercise jurisdiction over persons who meet the eligibility criteria that we've set out elsewhere, right? Not here, elsewhere, because we can change our policies and procedures way easier than having to come before council and go through the whole legislative process are accepted for admission by the team 
not by this other court, by us. There, jurisdiction, covered. It can be this simple. Note many other jurisdictional provisions are a little bit more complicated than this. That's your own tribal prerogative. Good luck with that. Um, I think it can be pretty straightforward, but I also note that for the same reasons we wanted to codify to begin with, courts have not deferred so heavily to the policies and procedures and have built them into the code just to make it more in line with the rest of the judiciary, as well as to really like solidify um, uh, equal protection, the right to access the healing to wellness court. So it doesn't seem shrouded under the policies and procedures that don't have the same open and transparency that the code has. Um, I wanted to just note this be, as we mentioned earlier, not all healing to wellness courts, even those that incorporate the name court, really see themselves as part of the judiciary. They see themselves more as like a, a different type of iteration. And I think there are perfectly good reasons to think about it that way, right? Especially if you're trying to reject the adversarial uh, component of a court, but also the just the, the weight of the court that we really want to like, we're not just diverting from the trial court, we're diverting from the system, right? And we're coming over here. So I wanted to provide this language as just other ways that courts have conceived of that. And then same for the authority. Um, there, you know, some courts are, are very straightforward about this, that the wellness court has the same authority as any other court that, you know, any other docket that is developed in here. Other courts are more um, restrictive and other courts are broader, right? They want to acknowledge that the Healing to Wellness Court does more than the typical court. They're bringing in social services. They're bringing in substance abuse treatment. They're getting creative. They might go take a field trip, something the trial court wouldn't necessarily do. And so we want to acknowledge that their authority is either narrower or more expansive than what you might see in the rest of the docket. Okay, so that brings us to entry and discharge. And by this, I mean, how do we get in and how do we get out of the Healing to Wellness Court? So, especially for the adult criminal um, provisions, there's a lot of thought that's put into how you are eligible for the wellness court. A lot of courts pick one of these. Deferred prosecution, as in no charges are filed. Post plea or pre-conviction, we file charges, but we haven't had a trial yet, and you haven't had to say if you were guilty or not. Deferred sentencing, all right, we had a trial. You pled. Um, now, it's like, but we haven't sentenced yet, so we're bringing you over to the Healing to Wellness Court as like in lieu of your sentence, but have the right to sentence you, or as a component of your sentencing. So a lot of tribes like pick one, right? And this is the way we're going to do it. And there's advantages to picking one, right? I think the biggest one that comes to my mind is equal protection, fairness. Are similarly situated people treated the same? Do they have the same opportunities? It's a little bit tricky when somebody is in here um, pre-plea and somebody's in here as a sentencing option. The incentives are just different. The consequences are vastly different, right? On the other hand, I think a lot of other tribes are like, we want an open door, right? Some people are just not going to be ready and think that, you know, if they uh, especially because we've been so indoctrinated in this adversarial system where you lie and you never confess and you just fight tooth and nail into the end, it might not be until the sentencing option that a person is willing to entertain the idea of healing to wellness court. But we also want to incentivize those people that do plead early, that are eager to take advantage of the healing to wellness court and avoid some of those um, criminal justice consequences bring them all in. So I think it is um, nice from a fairness perspective when the code lays out, here's the deal. 
here's who has access to um, the Healing to Wellness Court, including for those individuals that want to be you know, intentional about how they're approaching their criminal justice case, have a frank conversation with your defense counsel, if they exist, with your advocate, if you exist, by yourself, if you're having to negotiate all this alone, um, you have the code to say, ah, like, here's how I can get in. Here's, here's where I'm allowed to ask for this if it's not already being offered, which it should absolutely be offered at every step that it's permissible. That's criminal. So much of the code is focused on this criminal structure. But of course, for our juvenile, de juvenile delinquency courts, for our family civil courts, we have other options for getting into the healing to wellness court, such as via social, social services. We also have this uh, initially small but growing phenomenon of transfers from foreign jurisdiction. Individuals who had started with a state case or from another tribe or from like as some sort of condition of their probation where they're coming into the healing to wellness court love those. They're amazing. They are such a uh, incredible exercise of tribal sovereignty in which we're reclaiming lost tribal members and bringing them back into the fold, into our own services, right? It's incredible. If we have a code that is very explicit that only individuals with deferred sentencing from the tribal court are eligible to enter healing the wellness court, we've just injected like our own stopgap from accommodating those transfers from foreign jurisdictions or from uh, non-criminal referral points. Uh, so this is like both an opportunity and a potential like trap. The other advantage and where I think a lot of tribes have really enjoyed codification is it compels all the other aspects of the tribal judiciary to play ball. It's one thing where it's like we have the originators of the Healing Wellness Court, this incredible core group of grassroots advocates that, that design the Healing Wellness Court and are getting participants in, but it's just them. The rest of the tribal court could care less. They're not really into it. They don't really buy it. They don't really get it. Codifying it, twist their arm. Don't really care if you don't like healing the wellness court, if you're not buying into it, now you have to entertain it as a deferred sentencing option. This is a right that litigants have in this tribal judiciary, whether or not you like it. Now it's a requirement that has huge advantages for the whole system. Uh, referral points. Okay, the entry is usually helps take care of who can refer. But again, one of the beautiful things of a healing to wellness court is it doesn't necessarily have to be limited to that narrow criminal justice path, right? We wanna have referral points broadly. We want lots of people, including before we get to the point that there's a charge. Do we need to articulate who has the authority to refer, who has the obligation to refer. Again, going after maybe those less uh, enthusiastic uh, partners on our team by codifying as a component of their own roles and responsibilities for their job, you're now a referral point. If you encounter an individual who is eligible for Healing to Wellness Court, it's now your job to make this referral. Um, that can be advantageous. Um, but this certainly is relevant for the code if we need to authorize these individuals, especially those who are operating in a way that is normally outside of their typical duties. For example, um, a supervising officer, a police officer, a social service um, a representative. In some ways, there has been concern that you know, acknowledging the benefits of healing to wellness court is a conflict of interest. Putting it in the code alleviates those concerns, right? We hereby acknowledge that this is not a conflict of interest, rather this is an obligation of your job to assist this person and their family by making this referral. Um, and then some codes, of course, have wanted to ensure the opportunity for those to self-refer, especially when we get very technical and legalese, we might cut off that opportunity. We wanna make sure we leave that open. 
Um, with the eligibility, the, <laughs> the extent to the detail of these provisions varies really widely. So there's considerations for why we may or may not want to codify eligibility in the code, right? I have this widen or narrow the scope. For some courts, you know, there's the concern about who benefits from healing to wellness court. Who do we actually want in the wellness court? And for whom is it harmful, right? I'm sure in other, in other um, uh, workshops, we've talked about like the high risk, high need component. And for those that are lower risk and lower need, wellness court isn't just not a good idea. It can be a bad idea. Um, so we wanna make sure we're limited to only those individuals. But even then, we might have a, a more expansive need in the community than the wellness court actually has the capacity to address. And so we may want to narrow the scope of eligibility, not for just those who would benefit from healing the wellness court, but also to accommodate our own capacity. We wanna make it competitive. We wanna limit who can be in here because we can only serve 10 people, even though there's 50 that can use us. And so where do we wanna concentrate on the 10 most in need? We'll use our eligibility criteria to do that. Some um, require that there be a criminal history to go after the high risk, high need. Some limit on what criminal history can, um, can make you ineligible for healing to wellness court, right? Including um, history of aggravated sexual abuse or child sexual abuse and or uh, violent criminal history. I think these are discussions that have to happen internally within the tribe and with all, also within the healing to wellness court while also balancing, you know, who who's most in need of the wellness court? Is it in fact those who do have those severe criminal histories that we should in fact be targeting? Um, oh, Precious asked a good question about whether or not you know if your code is published online. I encourage you to uh, multitask and Google that. Um, funders limitations, for those of you that have entertained the wide wonderful world of federal funding, you know that there is a prohibition on um, violent offenders. There is constant talk about the need to get rid of that. It's a congressional insertion on the money and it's extremely frustrating, but that's a thing. Tribes have codified that requirement in their code that they uh, limit eligibility so that violent offenders are not eligible to be in wellness court. I personally, unless that's something that you also endorse, unless that's an actual tribal value that you also want to say like, yes, that's a limitation, I would resist codifying that in the code. The tribal code, I mean, yeah, like it's it's a real balance, right? You want you want all of your eligibility eligibility requirements to be centralized, right? The code provides notice to individuals, but I also don't think you want to cement yourself into values that maybe the tribe actually doesn't agree with. Um, it's a balance. It's a balance. So I see both, and I think there's there's arguments to be made for both sides, but, you know, depending on how easy or hard it is to modify your code, if Congress were to lift this requirement tomorrow, would you want to lift this requirement tomorrow, and could you? Um, like I said, the notice is like a really good reason to do it though. So it goes back and forth. So on the turquoise side, we have some of the um, components of eligibility that tribes have codified in here, right? The process for determining eligibility. Is this a process that is conducted by the trial court, such as part of your sentencing and whether or not determining this is gonna be a deferred sentence? Or is this a process that it's done by the Healing to Wellness Court, which may involve some of the same people, but also other members of the team, right? Is this process taking place in a closed door staff staffing, which might have some subjective determinations? Or is this like a checklist process where either you're eligible or you're not, and you can see and it's posted, you know, as part of the court record. Um, so having that process, especially if other aspects of tribal court process are heavily codified, I think there's a really great reason for also codifying this. Otherwise, that's very detail oriented. That is very specific. Um, I might say that for the policies and procedures. Uh, legal screening and clinical screening. These are of course parts of the process for determining eligibility. 
does someone have the requisite legal requirements that we are using, you know, via our widen or narrow the scope? Is someone actually uh, abusing substantive substances such that they would benefit from the treatment component of healing to wellness court? Time limitations of, uh, you know, there are tribes that if they codify anything about eligibility, they're codifying the time limitations. Um, how long does the wellness court have to make these determinations? Um, does this need to happen in seven days? Does the clinical screening need to happen within three business days? Um, the time limitations are great accountability metrics to make sure that we get fast um, entry into the wellness court. We know that that's one of the key components of wellness court, that this needs to happen quickly. And frequently, just the clunkiness of our own bureaucracies can slow down this process. The code is a tool to combat that. Um, and so I think you should really entertain um, that as an option. Doo -doo -doo. Okay, other neat considerations. Um, these are sort of like something to just look at, not requirement, but I've seen them in couples of code especially if the healing to wellness court is a pre-plea um, diversion. Courts have inserted in the code that um, participants waive their right to a speedy trial, which is a right recognized in the Indian Civil Rights Act because you are potentially postponing your trial for nine months or a year while you complete healing to wellness court. There can't be an instance where a participant agrees to this pre-plea deal, goes through seven months of the healing to wellness court, gets terminated, and then sues for their right to a speedy trial having been violated by the tribe because they allowed the participant to participate in healing to wellness court. Um, that's like, you know, that, those are lawyers coming up with scary problems in our heads. But nevertheless, I think this is a great thing, at least to include in like the recognition of what's happening to the participant when they're signing their consent form. Stipulations to preserve evidence for deferred prosecutions. Lots of prosecutors are worried about allowing um, pre-plea options because they're like, look, we're going to terminate this participant in seven months, and then I'm going to be asked to put on a trial, and everything's going to be stale, right? All my witnesses have will, you know, moved away. All the evidence will have been lost. Like, this is just going to be a mess. And so this is allowing that, like, look, we're just putting a pause on this button, but we're also trying to accommodate all the concerns of the prosecutor and the obligations they're going to have, assuming we have to prosecute later on. Does the participant have access to defense counsel within wellness court? This requires an examination to what rights does the tribe provide to litigants for counsel? Is there um, access to advocates? Is there access to licensed attorneys? And how do those rights translate to the healing to wellness court? Is there a designated defense counselor who serves all litigants? Will participants be allowed to integrate their own attorney of their own choosing as a member of the Healing to Wellness Court team, regardless of how that shakes out, I think participants have a right to know what they can and can't do. Conditions on entry, these are usually part of the consent form, but I think including them within the code serves like a nice notice option. Hey, heads up, if you participate in the Healing to Wellness Court, we have a right to say that you can't drink. We have a right to subject you to mandatory drug testing, which is arguably one of the biggest liberty intrusions of healing to wellness court besides the potential for jail incarceration. Um, other restraints, curfew. We might search your home. We might say who your roommates can be. These are all intrusions that from a due process standpoint, I think a participant has the right to know whether it's in the code or elsewhere. And then the HIPAA confidentiality, I think that's another thing, right? That you have to opt in to Healing to Wellness Court. This functions very differently than other adversarial courts in the sense that you need to, to, to allow us to um, right, put our fingers in places we wouldn't otherwise do. But arguably the benefits are much greater because having access to your health files allows all of us, including the participant, to come to the table on a you know, mutually uh, level playing field and work together.
but I think it should be out in the open. Okay. Discharge, I think discharge can be very straightforward, but this is how does someone get out of the healing to wellness court. And really what I've seen here for tribes is just articulating the decision-making process for how this goes. What does it take to successfully graduate? What does it mean to successfully graduate? Do your charges get thrown out? Do you get like a little you know, certificate badge? Do you get the right to expunge your records? It'd be nice to know what the legal consequences for graduation is. A neutral discharge. There's all sorts of reasons for a neutral discharge, but I think it's important for tribes to consider that as a possibility. Someone moves away. Uh, someone uh, like the, the case just sort of like takes a turn that was no fault through the wellness court or the participant, and yet they need to leave the healing to wellness court. There's a domestic violence incident and they need to leave. We need to be able to accommodate those uh, those instances without um, punishing uh, inadvertently the participant because of some unforeseen legal consequence. Termination. There are instances where we're going to have to uh, ask someone to leave the healing to wellness court. What are the legal consequences for that? More importantly, this is really where we see the, the breaker where we have, normally we have like the healing to wellness court that's operating with suspended rules of evidence. The, the healing to wellness court hearing is just less formal than other hearings, except for the termination hearing. Do we want to re-inject some of that formality, the right to a defense counselor, for example? And if we do that, Putting it in the code, I think, is a great way to articulate that, that like the wellness court can do what it does, see the policies and procedures, unless someone is going to be terminated from the healing and wellness court in which they are entitled to a hearing pursuant to, you know, all of the rights that we provide for our typical hearings, see, you know, our code provisions on tribal court hearings, um, something like that. Okay, cool. Um, Jordan and Precious, I'm sort of like peeking in on the chat, but if anything comes up, feel free to interrupt me. Okay, nothing quite yet. We're answering them as we go along in the chat. A lot of just sharing resources and such. I love it. Yeah, if anyone has their own tribal code provision that they want to share, please do. We'd love to see it. Operations, so our, our final component for consideration. Um, this is where, so, you know, I think the code is most relevant, you know, just looking at the wellness court from the outside of like, oh, people are coming in, people are going out, but we're not terribly concerned with what's happening in the healing to wellness court. These provisions are looking in the healing to wellness court and are arguably the most intrusive of the provisions, which is how we would characterize it, right? As a default, the Healing to Wellness Court, once it's established, gets to do whatever it wants to do, right? Have fun, non-adversarial, that's great. Here, the tribe has um, stepped away from that and has said, you're allowed to do whatever you want to do, except for this minimum floor of provisions that we're establishing. So you can do whatever you wanna do, so long as you comply with these minimum requirements that we're establishing. And as you can see, there's like pros and cons for establishing this floor. Team roles and responsibilities. There are definitely advantages for putting in the code, here are all of the different tribal agencies that shall participate in the Healing to Wellness Court. Court, this is happening. Judge, prosecutor, defense counselor, you are going to need to put resources aside dedicated for the participation within Healing to Wellness Court. This is now part of your roles and responsibilities. Treatment facility, social services, law enforcement, probation, all of these other entities that normally don't conceive of themselves as part of the judiciary, time to buckle up, things are changing, we have this new model and now this is part of your roles and responsibilities. And you might not like it, that's too bad. That's why we've codified it. This is happening. Responsibilities of each team member. Um, and I put particularly the judge. Um, for attorneys, 
there are likely um, ethical rules, professional rules of responsibility that attorneys and the judge have obligated themselves to either as members of a state bar and or members of the tribal bar. It could be that the Healing to Wellness Court deviates from some of those um, obligations. And so we want to provide in here that these are new obligations and that these are not intended to conflict. The big ones that come to mind are the participation in, quote, ex parte communications or communications outside of the presence of the participant, staffing. It's okay. Not only is staffing okay, it's now your job to participate in staffing. So judge, we have this whole provision of judicial rules of ethics and the other title of this code. When you're in wellness court, these are your new rules of ethics. Um, so I think especially if you have pretty extensive um, tribal bars and rules of judicial ethics, it's going to be important to ensure that the Healing to Wellness Court can operate in um, compliance with that or providing some statutory language to ensure that judges and attorneys are, are okay. There's also advantages to helping solidify some of this process, such as making referrals attending healing to wellness court hearings. If you are having a problem with attendance, people saying like it just doesn't fit in their day, let's make it a statutory requirement that this is happening. Uh, the wellness court coordinator, I put that in here. That's frequently one of the only positions that doesn't already exist. And so it could be that the either the tribe needs to like formally establish this as a position, which is rare, more likely, we need to encourage a, a, a sufficient funding. Um, ideally, not ideally. Ideally, the tribe just has lots of money and like dedicates this and it's not a problem whatsoever. Um, hopefully, if that's not the case, we have access to grant funding. But if that's not the case, we need some other way to um, connect the dots, make the ends meet where we had this value statement from the tribe that they want this restorative justice, they want this healing to wellness court, well, now it's time to pay for it. And that's in the form of paying a wellness court coordinator to help facilitate all of the inner workings of this wellness court. So we're gonna establish in the code that this is now a permanent position that needs to be incorporated in whatever relevant budget likely the tribal judiciary. So this needs to be a permanent fixture. Okay, wellness court procedures. Ideally, this is minimal. I'm really biased, but I think the benefits of a healing to wellness cart are its flexibility. And so what I like to see is the code acknowledge that the wellness court is operating that it's holding itself to its own measures of accountability, right? So I like to see the establishment of policies and procedures. Uh, maybe a minimum bar for what needs to be included in those policies and procedures. Maybe an opportunity that if there's something truly wonky in those policies and procedures that's just totally unfair or doesn't make any sense, that you have an opportunity to have the court reflect on that. But otherwise, what the, what's happening within the wellness court is reflected in the policies and procedures, and they have the authority to establish those. And we're really going to lean on and trust that the wellness court is doing what it needs to do. We'll provide little minimal opportunities. I think of it comparable to like administrative law, where the court is providing extreme deference to the wellness court to do your own thing. But if it's, if it's crazy out of line, then yeah, come back and see us. But otherwise, we're not going to be is having our fingers stuck in there. Nevertheless, here are some instances where we do see the code speaking on what is included in those policies and procedures. Um, the role of case management, either establishing that as an expectation or providing like minimum standards. A treatment plan, the fact that one needs to be created and we are expecting um, the treatment provider to be a, a heavy, heavy participant in that role. Supervision, we're expecting probation and law enforcement to be providing supervision. Also heads up, um, potential participants, supervision is going to be a big part of this. Drug testing. Drug testing is so huge in part because 
it's very invasive. Um, but also because the standards are pretty straightforward. So I feel like this is sort of like low hanging fruit. The um, you know, expected standards for like twice a week and what, you know, like a supervised um, drug test and what it's going to be, you know, what's involved in that is pretty straightforward across the board. So this is kind of an easy one to codify and provide notice and expectations of the wellness court without being overly intrusive in the wellness court records. I actually think this is totally a relevant role for the court to play that um, record keeping is one of the benefits of healing to wellness court that we're going to provide this extensive record, both as means of accountability for the participant, but also for the wellness court. It's a service for the participant and it's a service for the court. And so we have high expectations for record keeping. However, we might want to establish that those records are distinct from a participant's otherwise criminal justice record, that these records maybe are, um, are confidential or they are, you know, the, the court has a right to access those records, but only when names are deleted. And so it's just, you know, aggregate data. Um, we might want to establish uh, expectations that otherwise deviate from the standard record keeping expectations of the tribal judiciary. <laughs> wellness court hearing. As I mentioned, the wellness court hearing is often different than the trial court hearing. So especially if your tribe has a very extensive procedure in its code about what a hearing is, all of the rules of evidence, the court reporter, all of these like crazy um, due process expectations, we might just wanna note that the healing to wellness court hearing is not gonna operate this way, right? The standard rules of evidence are not going to be at play. A participant does not need to speak via their defense counselor. The prosecutor is not going to introduce evidence showing you know, all the bad things they did for that week. That's just not how this is going to, going to roll confidentiality and privilege protections, right? We wanna suspend those at least for the confines of the healing and wellness court hearing. Because this hearing is different, maybe we wanna establish that this is closed. We certainly wanna establish that anything you say here is not gonna be held against you, um, at least depending on if you're admitting to, to substance use. What will be held against you? This isn't like a free pass to go out committing crimes. Where is that balance going to be held? And we should, we should make that explicit. Um, so a lot of these are just decisions that need to be made, but I think you know, the, the easy way to do this is to look at what's already existing in our code and what do we want to explicitly deviate from in our healing to wellness court. We have another question, Lauren. Yeah. Um, so a team member, the Healing to Wellness Court, said they're having their uh, policies and procedures manuals approved by the council by resolution considered, is that considered codifying or is that different? Yeah, I think so. I imagine in, um, sorry, let me go back. In here, like the establishing the policies and procedures, I would put that as like the court has sort of like, it's like a quasi um, codification where the court has said, look, the wellness court is going to establish their policies and procedures and we reserve like a veto, right? Like, right? Like the court's not going to write provisions, but they get the authority to, or, or even the court, the, the council, right? The tribal council has a veto power. So they can say, looks good or try again. That's why I would characterize an approval. And there's pros and cons, right? From a like due process, transparency, accountability perspective. I think it's really nice to have the council approving those policies and procedures, right? Everyone buys in. We developed these, we articulated the tone, but like we're covered, right? On the other hand, it can be time consuming and it can be um, frustrating if the tribal council is very liberal with their veto power and starts overriding a lot of the healing and wellness court. So I, my ideal situation would be to structure it like that where the tribal council gets a yes or no, but does not have the opportunity to like do like a line item veto where they can like write in specific provisions. Nope, that's within the confines of the wellness court team. 
Um, and that just ensures the right wellness court as wellness court. Um, so yes, I would, I would characterize that as codifying the policies and procedures, but in a really like convenient way so that it's not all spelled out in the code itself. That was helpful. Okay, do, do, do. we've done that. Finally, incentives and sanctions. This does not come up in very many codes, but it's one of those things where, especially with jail, if a healing to wellness court is using jail as a sanction, I think it's nice to give a heads up. We might use jail as a sanction. Like you should know that before you sign on the dotted line. Um, other courts have included, like they wanted to just give a heads up that incentives and sanctions are a thing. We don't want you to be caught off guard. So for example, you might, you know, benefit you like get to have gift certificates or you might get um, a later curfew, or you might get access to some toiletry items or whatever, like there's gonna be a thing such as incentives. We're using just a such as list so that you like have an idea of what's coming, but the wellness court reserves the right to decide what those incentives will actually be. Or we want an exclusive list. We're gonna, we're really putting some handcuffs on the healing to wellness court that this is the, um, here's the list of possible incentives, and you can't use anything off of this list. Um, and so pros and cons to, to having an exclusive. Um, I sort of like using exclusive list more with the sanctions because sanctions are sanctions. And so having a very strong idea, a very strong heads up of the potential consequences that I might suffer based on this, that's nice. How does the court, how does the wellness court decide who gets an incentive and sanction, especially because this is a deviation from the heavy procedure of the trial court? I think it's nice to say like, look, week to week, the wellness court is gonna go into a room and they're gonna vote. And they're gonna decide whether or not you get an incentive or a sanction. You need to be prepared for that. Um, does the participant have a right to speak to the healing to wellness court before an incentive and sanction? For most healing and wellness courts, yes, yes they do. We should know that this is an informal process and we want this to be holistic. We want you to feel like you're heard. We wanna hear you. Um, but how, you know, this is, this is different than what's going on. And so you should know that this is gonna be different. All right. Ready for another question? Yeah, well, you know what? I'm ready for your questions. Let's do it. <laughs> Okay, uh, we have here, is there a national accepted criteria that does provide structure or guidance for a coordinator to also provide drug testing requirement as the certified screener? Ooh, that is a very specific question. Um, oh, Chris is not here, she would know. No, I think is, is the first answer in part because there's no like certificate that I know of, of um, providing like supervising a drug test. There are um, uh, national criteria for actually conducting like the drug test, right? Like sending it to a certified lab that's actually doing like the chemical analysis to determine the different toxins that are in this like urine sample. But actually supervising um, like someone urinating and putting it into a cup, I don't think there's any certification. I do think there's benefits to the tribe articulating, here's what like the expectations are. A, so you know like what to expect. It's sort of like knowing like what's gonna happen like in a doctor's office when they close the door. I think there's advantages there and that way in case something isn't going in that expected way, everyone knows like this is not how this was supposed to happen. But there's no like specific certification to ensure that that's the case. I imagine quite a few probation officers get training as part of their own like supervise, supervising officer training, but no, no certification. Great, thank you for that. Um, another question. What do you suggest when the person has concurrent or multiple jurisdiction criminal cases running, but the tribal case is now in the healing to wellness court? How do you juggle the person's comments against interest, record confidentiality, et cetera? This happens. <laughs> Yes, so this is such a great question. And this is where I think healing to wellness courts can thrive. Ideally, the, um, so at least for the, for the concurrent cases that are tribal cases, I would love to see as part of the healing to wellness court plan, a consolidation of those cases so that we, 
A, we don't have these like ridiculous um, conflict of interest stuff, but also so that I think the participant can feel like they're working towards a cohesive goal. It could be that even with like satisfactory graduation from wellness court, there's still going to be jail time for some of these cases, but we've at least like bundled it up so it's all working together. Um, if we are concerned, for example, there's a custody battle that's happening simultaneously. I think you could, I think it's perfectly reasonable that like, look, for healing to wellness court, this is open court, except for this participant where it's going to be closed court. And there's going to be an expectation of confidentiality when discussing this, this participant out of concern for like these other things. This is where I think having their defense counselor as a member of the team to sort of give an update for everyone ongoing that like, this is what's happening with these other cases, because the advantage of the healing to wellness court is we don't have to put on these fictitious blinders and pretend that we don't know that there's all these legal consequences out there. We do know, let's bring them to the surface and as a team figure out how we can help the whole person that includes all of these other cases. It obviously is tricky with cases beyond our jurisdiction, but to the extent feasible, I would love to see some site uh, attempt to collaborate with those other jurisdictions and give them a heads up. Look, we are meeting with this participant every week. We're drug testing this participant every like three days. Is there a way that we can incorporate the needs of your case to fall under this already very extensive supervision umbrella that we're already providing to alleviate some of these legal consequences? Um, I realize that's not um, super responsive, but, but it, you're right. It happens all the time. And I think the best we can do is acknowledge that that's a reality and do the best that we can to consolidate all of that. Thank you again. Um, another question. How does a tribal court get its decisions and codes accessible on Westlaw Next, uh, Lexis Nexus? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, it's very expensive is the short answer. Um, Westlaw and LexisNexis, I am not an affiliate with them. And so, you know, take all of this with a grain of salt. Um, uh, they are for-profit companies. And so they will negotiate a deal so that like you don't have to pay in order for you to post all of their stuff, but you will have to pay to access it. So a lot of tribes don't do that because all of a sudden like fancy, you know, attorneys in big cities have access to their laws while they don't. Um, and so that's why you don't see very many on there. Um, cool things that I've seen for codes, there's Munici code, um, though, like for tribes that have very, very extensive codes, I think that's one of the better resources that I've seen. That also costs money, but the benefits is I think you enjoy some of the benefits you would see on Westlaw and LexisNexis of like search functions, um, interrelationship, um, like some of the key citing. Again, not as extensive, but, but it's on there. Um, other tribes have submitted their tribal court decision. So that's for code. For, for case law, um, honestly, tribes that have posted just their case law, like their main appellate decisions, which I think is the most relevant, we don't need like every trial court decision. But appellate decisions, just posting those is cool. Um, there are intertribal courts such as the Northwest Indian um, Law Association. They have posted those decisions. That's cool. Um, these, there's the American Indian Law Reporter out of UNM that I believe. That's like one of the primary American Indian Law Reporters. If, if my tribe was interested in like doing something like that, I would look there first. Um, it offers like medium level key citing and stuff, but you can still do like intertribal um, you know, com compare and contrast. So I think part of the question is like, who are we trying to like reach with our appellate decisions? You know, first and foremost, litigants in our own court. Um, and then, you know, ideally like the greater outside world. But, you know, there are about 15 tribes that post their stuff on Westlaw and LexisNexis. So if you just Google them and like contact, you know, a representative, there's someone that's going to be over the moon to talk to you about the options for getting tribal court decisions up there. And as a practitioner who is extremely interested in accessing more tribal case law, I would be elated either way. Great, um, so we have five minutes left everyone. Do you have any more questions for Lauren? She is a wealth of information here. No pressure, this is like, 
We're talking about boring codification, so I get it. <laughs> All right. Well, um, well, for what it's worth, it was my absolute honor to be here. I hope that this was beneficial. This was obviously, um, you know, frustratingly intended to just get the creative juices going, um, no provisions. But I do believe as a handout for um, this session, I have included a list of all the tribal codes that I looked at for this presentation. And so if you are eager to um, actually get your eyes on some specific code provisions, you'll be able to look up all of those tribal codes. And I'm certainly happy to point you to any specific code provisions um, in relevance to that. Um, for those of you that are paying attention to um, TLPI publications, there will be a publication articulating all these code provisions coming out, but based on like the federal government's timeline, it's probably like a year from now. I have no idea. Oh, great. Thank you so much. Um, I'm not too sure if I cut your screen sharing off early, if you want to share your list. Okay, great. Um, thank you, everybody. Um, Thank you for attending today's plenary, Healing to Wellness Corp co-development with Lauren Van Schultgarn. Recordings will be posted on this platform and will remain up until July 30th. After this time, you may find recordings at enhancementtraining.org. Please uh, remember to do your session evaluation. Actually, no, not for plenaries. Um, but for the remaining uh, sessions today, please remember to do your evaluation and the overall evaluations as well. Um, I know 